repairing can be properly done. Uh, so, Sergeant, do you see the share screen button at the bottom, you know, along with record and chat and participants? And yeah, I do. And if you click on that, uh, does it raise a, a little menu? Yeah, it says one participant at a time, multiple participants. Multiple, yeah, click multiple participants, and then that allows okay. others to share their screen. Okay, I just did that. Uh, Ralph, can you please yes. check? Yes, now it works. It, it, it's working now. I see it now. Ah, yes. okay. That this is interesting because yeah, there I think must have a, been some. Hmm. I think it was a recent change. I heard that they because of this uh, Zoom bombing issue, they I made see. it harder to share screens. I, I have to keep this in mind because I do my group meetings on Mondays, so I've not had a problem with this, but this seems like a new thing that I have to keep track yeah, of. I believe it was in the last week or two, yes. Ah, okay, that may be because my last meeting was, uh, was two weeks ago. So, so I, should I share it now, my screen, then? Uh, yeah, please. Okay, can, you, can people see my... Uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's, so it's ready to go, uh, I guess, okay, in, we'll, no, when you're ready. A, yeah, start in a few minutes. Okay. This would be a great experiment. I'm yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like being part of an experiment. This <laughs> <laughs> is a super experiment. So I, I talked, with, I communicated with Mike Naughton last week. Uh -huh. out, of, out of the blue, he sent me a, a text. I haven't communicated with him in decades. And just out of the blue, I guess because he's sequestered at home like we all are. He got, yeah. he got bored enough to, to <laughs> communicate with me again. He's doing okay? Yeah, he was doing fine. He's, he's watching very old basketball games. We, we used to play basketball together. Um, I see. Mike and I, and so um, he's watching the uh, twenty no thirty five year old basketball games from from when we were when when we worked together okay. in, in <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> so Ralph, uh, you will see plenty of people uh, already who have come in, and some will join probably more around eleven ish. Uh huh. Um, you see Dave Landau from Georgia who has joined in, but Dave will have to leave uh, shortly, and then he might uh, join back in. He has another meeting. Uh, you have uh, uh, Ganpati, uh, Sambhat Murthy Ganpati, he's, uh, Murthy, he's our current chair. Uh, you have Dave Kofsky from Chemical Engineering in Buffalo. Uh, wow, quite a, quite, a, quite a nice selection. I hope I can make it uh, understandable. <laughs> Uh, you'll do great. Uh, there is Professor Esi Mahanti from Michigan State. Uh, Sudong Hu is one of my colleagues, the mm -hmm. quantum computing guy. Um, oh. uh, Luis Machado from uh, Para in Brazil, who was uh, who visited me for a year. Wow. My student Nathaniel, uh, Kunal, Kevin, they're all my students. Ali and then Hao is one of my colleagues here. Uh, Tad is joining in from Brock University. He's a professor there, Tad Arun. Wow. Uh, so you already have... Uh, the gentleman here is Rajat Basu. He's one of my friends. He's actually a physicist. Uh, he used to work <laughs> in Honeywell. He's retired now. Uh, so there he is. Uh, and then you have Alexandre Rosa, who is also from Brazil, who is actually Luis's professor. Hmm. And Alexander was one of my students 20 years ago in one of the Pan American Science Institute. Fantastic. So, uh, so this, this is... how, how are things in Brazil? Not so good. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, things are not so good here either. So. Yeah, I think we are competing <laughs> for the worst president. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a sad competition. Yeah, yeah it is. Very scary right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have a full curfew at nine o'clock uh, going in every night. Yeah, we do at eight here, which is bad because that's the time it gets pleasant. You know, yeah, you can go true. outside at eight around here now. Yeah. 
Yeah, it must be very hot. Over here, we, we wear jacket weather yesterday. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm so sorry I can't be there. <laughs> we, we had 112 uh, Fahrenheit. I don't know, uh, didn't calculate whether that wasn't Celsius, but that's, that's too hot already in May, 112. So it's, it's too that hot. That is pretty crazy. All right, how are we doing on time? We are a few minutes off. This thing should be okay. I see Minaj joining in. Minaj is joining in from India. Well, just as a warning, I have a very, I have a very old laptop that I'll be presenting on, and if it collapses, <laughs> I have a, I have an iPad behind here. It'll take me a few minutes to switch over, but hopefully, hopefully this uh, decade-old technology will still pull through. Is it? It's, it's a laptop. It's not a Mac. Not a, not a Mac, it's a PC <laughs> laptop. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I still live in the PC world, mostly. Yeah, I, I, I switched to a Mac sometime back. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah. I, I had Mac die on me, so I didn't, I got angry and didn't buy Mac for like a decade. Oh, really? But then, I, then I've gone back and like a Saturday. That's unusual, because yeah. usually they're reliable, huh? Yeah. This was a Mac. This was a large, expensive MacBook Pro that uh, that I had bad luck with. Oh, but I have a MacBook Air, and that's been it. okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, maybe someday I'll I'll advance into the 21st century, but not yet. <laughs> See, something happened to your. Am I not? Something's wrong? No, no, everything is fine. It was just that I touched something. I shouldn't. Okay, so. Uh, we are getting up there. A few minutes. I'm going to introduce Ralph and then uh, basically we'll try and mute ourselves out. And what I suggest we do is uh, uh, you post the questions on the on the chat, I will be monitoring the chat carefully. And <clears throat> once the talk's done, I'll be happy to ask your question. That way, uh, we can avoid crosstalk. Uh, but that's just a suggestion. That's the way I see the big ones being done, the big meetings being done. So I'm, also, I, I'm, yeah, also ha I'm also happy to answer questions as I'm presenting, if you want to raise them, if that's- Yeah, important. I mean, Easiest thing maybe to just post them and I can ask it uh, that way we can mm -hmm. yep. uh, keep it a little bit more. Uh, I sure. really don't know how many people will join in, but my, my guess will be there'll be quite a few. So. I see Chandan Das Gupta has joined from IIC Bangalore. Ralph, you probably know him, right? Say again the name. Chandan Das Gupta from Bangalore. He used to be in Minnesota many years ago. I, I guess I know the name, but I not I don't remember meeting him, so I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Hello Shrajit. I am I am on Zoom, so Ah, yeah, I saw you. <laughs> very good, very good. The connection is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it works. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I am putting the mic on. Talk huh? is going on. When the talk is going on, I'll put the mic on mute. Yeah, I just, basically what I'm going to request is we keep the mics on mute. And if you have questions, you just uh, pose it on the chat and I'll be happy to ask. And then, uh, one can follow up if you. Okay. Okay, so it's about 11, I think. So let's get started. I'm going to uh, introduce Ralph. So that is the right thing to do. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so very much for uh, joining in. Uh, this, is, this is unbelievable that sitting in my dining table, this can be done. Um, so our speaker today is somebody that uh, I have known for a long time, so I wanted to hear him. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Ralph Chamberlain. Uh, Ralph did his undergraduate degree uh, 
at the University of Utah. Uh, he worked with Oris Simco. I hope to get Oris at some point in this. He's an incredible guy, for those of you who know him. Uh, he received his PhD uh, in 1984 from the University of California at Los Angeles, where he worked with Ray Orbach. Uh, Ralph spent the following two years as a postdoc at UPenn working with Paul Jakin and joined Arizona State in 1986. His career has shifted between experiments, theory, and computer simulations, so that's quite incredible. Uh, he has been involved in developing and interpreting stretched exponential relaxation for thin glasses, uh, non resonant spectral hole burning for supercool liquids, and nano thermodynamics uh, for the thermal and dynamical properties of complex systems on the scale of uh, nanometer. So, Ralph is, uh, of course, a very accomplished uh, scientist, and it's a pleasure to have him. And without taking uh, any time away from you, I'd let you uh, get close. It's all you. Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, and as I said, I'm very sorry I have to be here in Arizona where it's too hot <laughs> and I wish I could be there in person in Buffalo, but here, here we go anyway. Um, okay, so I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators listed here. So today I'm going to talk about something relatively new in equilibrium thermodynamics. By relatively new, I mean that it's only 58 years old. But in a field that was thought to be essentially complete 140 years ago, 58 years is not so long. So to give you a preview of what I'll be talking about, I have this slide. It's a cartoon sketch of various length scales and the kinds of physics we use to describe the behavior on these length scales. So if we have large systems with just a few degrees of freedom, then we usually use classical mechanics, Newton's laws to describe the behavior. If it has many degrees of freedom, then we usually use statistical mechanics, the laws of thermodynamics to describe the behavior. So it's well known that the laws of classical mechanics break down when you go to small systems and, and we use the rules of quantum mechanics when we have small systems. It's not so well known that the laws of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics get modified when you go to small systems and we should use small system thermodynamics or nano thermodynamics to describe small systems. Um, and so although this theory is 58 years old, what we've been focusing on is how this theory can also influence the behavior of bulk materials. So how the local and transient response on the nano scale inside bulk materials can influence the statistical mechanics of the whole sample and therefore modify the temperature effective local temperatures inside bulk samples, and hence the title. Okay, so this is an outline of what I'll be talking about. I'll present experiments and computer simulations to show that a single uniform temperature is inadequate for describing the dynamics inside of materials. I'll then present the theory of nanothermodynamics and use it to describe, uh, provide novel explanations for old problems, such as Gibbs paradox, non-classical non critical scaling, and uh, if there's enough time in the end, I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, Boltzmann's paradox, which is the arrow of time, how nanothermodynamics might also provide a uh, explanation for that, and finish with conclusions. So because um, I tend to run out of time, I thought it might be useful to uh, um, give an overview of the key points from each of these sections. And so that's what I'll do now. First of all, from the experiments. Um, so uh, the standard uh, concept of thermodynamics assumes that you have a heat bath with a uniform temperature, same temperature everywhere inside the heat bath. And although that is true, what we find for the primary response, the, the main dynamics inside of bulk materials is that there is not a single temperature. So we use the a technique called non-resonant spectral hole burning to establish that there are multiple temperatures governing the dynamics inside of bulk materials, the, the, the primary dynamics inside of bulk materials. So these are Local, this is a cartoon picture with local temperatures that are different than the bath temperature because there are heat resistors that are preventing the immediate thermal flow to the heat bath. And so the local temperatures can be different than the, than the bath temperatures for minutes or even hours uh, it can take for the 
thermal contact between the local degrees of freedom and the heat bath. As for the molecular dynamics simulations, um, so standard statistical mechanics uh, gives us the equipetition theorem that the uh, temperature dependent contributions to potential energy and kinetic energy should be identical in, in classical molecular dynamics and classical statistical mechanics. And we find that that's true from, from molecular dynamics simulations within a few uh, hundredths of a percent at least. So that's extremely accurately obeyed by molecular dynamic simulations for the equilibrium uh, average energies and the equation, but not for the fluctuations. The equilibrium fluctuations we find depend strongly on temperature. The ra this ratio, which should also be equal to one, is very different from one. So here, here we see the averages at one. This is a, this is a log log plot of, of fluctuations or averages as a function of temperature log log plot for uh, Leonard Jones model and um, uh, nitromethane model simulated. And so the average values are very accurately equal to the uh, given by the equipetition theorem, but the fluctuations, fluctuation theorems, fluctuation relations do not agree with statistical mechanics. And um, it's, you know, a factor of 10, 100, even several thousand times larger fluctuations in potential energy than fluctuations in kinetic energy, which corresponds to temperature differences for the uh, potential energy fluctuations over the kinetic energy fluctuations of factors of, of 7 to 55 or so at the lowest temperature. So why or how can this be explained? And that we go to thermo nanothermodynamics. So standard thermodynamics, this is the fundamental equation of thermodynamics. It's, it's basically conservation of energy. Um, and uh, there are, you know, total energy is conserved, but there are different ways to change the energy. So this is a cartoon sketch of, of diff different energy levels and how the different contributions to energy change change the energy levels. So here's a thermal distribution of energy levels. That thermal distribution can be modified by adding heat, which changes the occupation of the levels. It can be modified by doing work, which changes the energy levels, the values of the energy levels, or it can be changed by adding particles, which changes the average, which changes the number in each level like this. So those are the three standard ways of changing the energy in standard thermodynamics. But there's another way that you can change energy, which is not contained in standard thermodynamics, and that's by including finite size effects. So this is a new pair of conjugate variables that was introduced in 1962, which provides a, a new contribution to energy that is not contained in standard thermodynamics. It comes from finite size effects, surface terms, length scale effects, fluctuation terms, et cetera, which you can think of as broadening the energy levels, which allows the system to lower its energy to find its true thermal equilibrium. So that's the basic idea of what I'll be, those are the basic ideas that I'll be talking about today. Okay. So first of all, from the experiments, so I'll talk first about uh, time-dependent specific heat measurements. So the idea is you put a heat pulse on one side of the sample and measure the temperature as a function of time on the other side of the sample. So here I you know, have a poor man's simulation of what's happening. So, so heat pulse goes across, it heats up the, the thermometer and you measure that as a function of time. So this is temperature difference, temperature rise as a function of time, time on a logarithmic scale. And what you expect is that the heat, the temperature will drop, rise sharply at first as the heat traverses the sample. The temperature will then stabilize at a value which depends upon the heat capacity. If you have a large heat capacity, there'll be a small uh, temperature increase. If you have a small temp, uh, heat capacity, there'll be a large temperature increase. It will stay at that value for the heat capacity for a while and then come back exponentially as the heat leaks out of the wires that connect the, the, the sample to the cryostat. So this exponential curve, so on, on this kind of semi-logarithmic uh, plot, an exponential curve is a sigmoidal shape like this. That exponential relaxation at long times is, was predicted or actually measured by Newton 319 years ago. Remember he was the head of the Royal Mint and so he was interested in how things cooled, gold and silver, how they cooled. And so he measured that things cooled off exponentially. And he could understand where that came from because he was one of the inventors of calculus. So this seems to be uh, easily understood in terms of one of Newton's laws. Um, however, there's a problem in that this simple type of behavior is never observed on any substance 
when you measure it at low enough temperatures. So what's actually observed is this. <clears throat> so yes, it rises as the heat traverses across the sample, and yes, it returns exponentially at long times as the heat comes out of the sample, but in between, there's heat going somewhere else. It's not going across the sample, it's not coming out of the sample, it's going from one part of the sample to another part of the sample. So this is clear and direct evidence from the second law of thermodynamics, the only way you get heat flows if there's a temperature difference, clear and direct evidence that there must be different temperatures inside the sample, at least two different temperatures, the temperature of the heat bath and the temperature of something else. And this something else is not small. So if you look at the uh, specific heat as a function of temperature on a log-log plot, we expect Debye's theory for specific heat, T cubed, at low temperatures. And that works okay in ultra pure uh, quartz crystals at, at temperatures down to a Kelvin or so. Uh, but then the uh, initial, it works only for the initial uh, specific heat. The specific heat that comes from this, the, this peak at short times agrees with Debye theory down to low temperature, but the equilibrium long time thermal equilibrium specific heat is, you know, an order of magnitude or so higher than Debye theory. And that's coming from these slow degrees of freedom, the heat flowing into these slow degrees of freedom. So the equilibrium specific heat of every substance that's been measured does not agree with Debye theory. Um, and for amorphous silica, it's even worse. So, you know, orders of magnitude too high. Uh, the, um, uh, these localized degrees of freedom uh, are by far the dominant source of heat capacity in these materials at these temperatures. Okay, so we were interested in understanding this uh, behavior uh, more. And so uh, we developed a technique called non-resonant spectral hole burning. And the basic idea is instead of putting the heat into the heat bath, we will put the extra energy, the extra heat into the deg slow degrees of freedom themselves. And we do that with a large amplitude uh, uh, pump oscillation in some sort of field. It could be in an electric field or a magnetic field or a strain field. This large pump oscillation adds energy. And the advantage is that you can change which degrees of freedom you pump the energy in by changing the frequency of the pump oscillation. So this is typically on the order of a hertz or so here, you know, uh, 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 10 millihertz up to two hertz, somewhere in there. Um, and then you probe the re response of the sample with a time step, probe the entire spectrum of response in a time step. Um, and that's what's shown over here. The trouble is you can't use a thermometer on the heat bath for this because that would not measure the temperature of these local degrees of freedom. So instead what we do is we use the the time scale of the responding degrees of freedom to deduce the temperature change. So, you know, assuming something like an Arrhenius law for the, the time dependence, then the uh, change in temperature depends upon the change on the logarithmic scale, the time scale. And so that's what you see here. So the solid curves are after uh, no pump oscillation, just the probe step. And the dashed curves, you have to look closely, but there are dashed curves with next to each solid curve which comes from pump, these different pump oscillations. And the important thing to notice is that the uh, high frequency, two hertz, uh, shifts, the, the dashed curve sticks out most at short times. So this is uh, dielectric constant as a function of time, semi-logarithmic sc scale, time scale down here, you know, uh, tens of milliseconds out to hundreds of seconds. The, Can I ask a question? Excuse me. Yes. Is there a local, uh, I mean, is there a fluctuation of temperature across the samples, sample to sample fluctuation of local temperature or temperature of local degrees of freedom, as you say? It's, it's some sort of localized degrees of freedom that have a, that because of their slow response, they are weakly coupled to the heat bath. And so their temperature, at least temporarily, if you were to wait forever, this is very yeah, slow relaxation. Many samples. Will the fluctuation be same for all of them? No. Will there be a sample to sample fluctuation of temperature for local degrees of freedom? Well, Is there a temperature distribution if you focus on a particular degree of freedom? Um, there are different time scales for the different degrees of freedom, yes. So, so there's a whole spectrum of, of time scale. So this is a stretched exponential relaxation, not so a I'm single. Asking, 
sample to sample fluctuation? Uh, these are big samples, so uh, the, I guess there could be, certainly there would be different differences between the samples, but um, the, this is the general there behavior. Are fluctuations of temperature. These are fluctuations of energy, which could be interpreted as fluctuations in temperature, yes. Okay. okay. All right, so, so here, are the, here are the results. The dielectric constant is a function of time, logarithm of time. And it sticks, the dashed curves stick out most at short times after the, uh, the high frequency pump oscillation and mostly at long times after the low frequency pump oscillation. It's really hard, these are offset for clarity. And uh, it's really hard to see this, but here's a blow up of that, of that curve here. And you can see that um, the, the, the modified curve is offset from the unmodified, unpumped curve. And um, we argue that this is a temperature shift. So if it was an energy shift, if it was a, a change in the, in the energy barriers, then it would change the amplitude of response. But the, the total amplitude of response, the, the dispersion step stays the same. So what all that happens is you have shifted the time scale of the response, shifted horizontally on the logarithmic scale, which corresponds to an effective change in, in the local temperature of that degree of freedom, of the degrees of freedom that were pumped. And you can change which degrees of freedom by changing the pump frequency, and that governs which degrees of freedom that you, you pump the energy into. And so here's, uh, you can see tens of, of millikelvin corresponding to the shifts here. So that's you know, you know, a few, few tenths of a percent of the temperature change by pumping a huge amount of energy in. And this kind of behavior is seen in liquids, glasses, polymers, and crystals, and also in spin glasses. So here are some of our results from spin glasses with a pump of 30 hertz and a pump of 30 millihertz, and you see that there's virtually no overlap in the degrees of freedom modified by these, by these pump oscillations. These curves are obtained with this simple box model with no adjustable parameters. The only input is the specific heat of the sample of the, of the slow degrees of freedom and joule heating and Ohm's law for the amount of energy that was pumped in, no adjustable parameters, and these are the curves that you expect from standard uh, theory. So, so this seems to be a, a very general phenomenon. The primary response of virtually all substances show this kind of thermodynamic heterogeneity. Okay, questions before I move on? Uh, I okay. have a question. I mean, do, we, do you always need some slow degrees of freedom for seeing this effect? Or, I mean, you are talking about uh, spin glasses or glasses and that, that yes. you know that there are some slow for, degrees of freedom. For technical... But, I mean, if you just, for, for technical reasons, for, example. for technical reasons, it's difficult to make this kind of experiment at, at faster than milliseconds or you know maybe microseconds. But I, you know, we believe that it happens to at least nanoseconds, if not faster. That these um, that these uh, thermodynamic heterogeneities and the molecular dynamic simulations that I show next will show that it actually happens on picoseconds. And so that's uh, so it does seem to. Okay have not a, uh, doesn't have to be slow degrees of freedom, but for this experiment it does because, because mm -hmm. of te technical issues. Good, good question, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's uh, uh, our molecular dynamic simulations. We use a standard software. Um, we use a standard model, Leonard Jones, 12.6 Leonard Jones. So the potential is a function of radius. So between one atom and a neighboring atom looks something like this. Um, we simulate large systems, 50,000 to 500,000 atoms in a, a periodic boundary conditions on the outside of the simulation. And um, so the, we, we, we use uh, the microcanonical ensemble for the simulation. So energy is conserved, just Newton's laws are governing these, uh, these atoms. We measure at low temperatures where it's uh, an FCC crystal. Um, but then we subdivide the sample into blocks. And these blocks are imaginary, mathematical blocks. And uh, so the, the, in principle, atoms could come in and out of these blocks, which would form the grand canonical ensemble. But then we choose the walls of the blocks so that it's between in the crystalline plane, so that the number of particles does not change. So that's actually the canonical ensemble. So the, the rest of the sample is providing the thermal bath for this local region 
and we're, so it should be in the canonical ensemble. So what do we expect for the average kinetic energy and average potential energy in the canonical ensemble? Well, this is a classical system, so we expect equipetition theorem, and uh, indeed that's what we find, and so the properly um, normalized kinetic energy per particle and potential energy per particle should yield three halves, and that's exactly what we see. So this is, this is uh, average energy difference as a function of cutoff distance. So we, we changed the cutoff distance of the Leonard Jones potential. And so you can see that the uh, potential energy three halves works fine only when you include the parabola at the bottom of the well. When if you cut off the interaction so that you have only repulsive forces, so it's essentially an ideal gas, then of course the potential energy doesn't have the equipetition theorem uh, result. There's no quadratic term. Uh, to, to yield the equipetition, so it works only for the kinetic energy for the ideal gas, but for both things, uh, potential and kinetic energy at, at longer cutoff distances. And um, that agrees with the empirical results of Durand and Petit that you have the, the um, uh, three has plus three has six uh, uh, kT for the um, or I guess three kT, three six halves kT for the for the samples at these low temperatures. So these these are from uh, averages over four different temperatures in, in this uh, low temperature range. So everything seems to work. You all know where the equipetition theorem comes from. Just integrating the the energies, um, uh, oops, the the potential and kinetic energies over the volume and and distances uh, over the velocities and distances. And um, you get the three halves from doing this, uh, three halves kT, and so that's for each of these things, uh, three halves kT. So that's well understood and works fine. But uh, this should also apply for the fluctuations. And so uh, by taking the uh, temperature derivative of the averages, then uh, temperature uh, appears explicitly in two places here and in the uh, um, partition function in the de denominator, derivative of the numerator gives us another expression for kinetic energy, kinetic energy squared and derivative of the denominator gets the average squared. And so this is the standard fluctuation relation. So combined, these two things say that the derivatives of the energy with respect to temperature and the fluctuations of energy with respect to temperature should have three halves because the three dimensional system, three halves for each of them like that. Okay, so what do we see? Well, for the kinetic energy is not too bad. So the kinetic energy fluctuations, um, more or less agree with three halves, uh, certainly three halves for the ideal gas, but when the potential energy is on, then maybe a little bit low. It's within the error bars, not really, but it, it's close. The potential energy, however, is very different. This is what we find for the potential energy fluctuations. So it follows the uh, averages at low, uh, at short cutoff. For the ideal gas, it works. For the uh, harmonic lattice, this is where there's only interactions between nearest neighbor atoms, the purely harmonic lattice, where these are at the bottom of the well. It works well, at least it's temperature independent um, over this range of temperatures, but it's a little bit low. Uh, you know, about two thirds of the value it should be. But then starting when you get a second neighbor, a nonlinear interaction, a non-harmonic interaction. So this second neighbor is on the side of a potential well then the fluctuations of potential energy take off. And you can see that, you know, it's strongly temperature dependent and strongly range dependent. Not, the amount of nonlinear uh, interaction makes a, a, a big important difference. Okay, so since these fluctuations relations are basically just identical. One, just one question. Uh, uh, do these things depend very crucially on the size of the system that you're simulating? No. 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 Yeah, I, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, all of this, as long as the system is large enough that you have a small part inside of a large system. So, so we find that to get this excess fluctuation down to 1% of where it should be, we have to go to, I think it's 80 billion atoms. I see. 80 billion atoms. But, you know, that's what we pro project. We didn't do that simulation, but that's what it projects. So it is not size dependent. Uh, it does depend a little bit on the size of the blocks, but uh, not on the size of the system. Okay, good, good question. Okay, so, 
So the fluctuation relations are, you know, based on the equal position theorem and the product rule of, of calculus. So it's, you know, basically an, an identity should work. The only key assumption is that we have to assume that Boltzmann's factor works not only for the equilibrium averages, but also for the fluctuations. So that's the breakdown. Boltzmann's factor works for averages, equilibrium averages, but not for the dynamics, not for the fluctuations, at least not in systems that are governed by Newton's laws. Okay, so let's see why. Why could Boltzmann's factor break down for dynamics? Okay, so here is uh, what I showed on the introductory slide, the fluctuation, uh, fluctuations as a function of temperature, logarithm of temperature, uh, log log plot. And so here's the averages, uh, the ratio equaling one as it should, but the ratios are strongly temperature dependent, 10, 100, 3000 times too large at low temperature. Um, larger than expected from standard statistical mechanics. So, so that, um, and if you look at, here's a correlation. So in, from molecular dynamics simulations, you can look at what's going on inside the sample. And so this is correlations between the nearest neighbor blocks. So when the energy of the center block goes up, what does the energy of the neighboring blocks around it do? So you can see that there's a strong anti-correlation, almost 100% anti-correlation for nitromethane, you know, 75% or so for the, the um, Leonard Jones system. And that this anti-correlation onsets as the excess fluctuations come on. And so it's a, the excess fluctuations seem to be and are indeed due to this anti-correlation in the neighboring energy. So let's see why. So Boltzmann's factor, this is from Feynman's book on statistical mechanics. Feynman calls it a fundamental physical law, the summit of statistical mechanics. But then he, and the two sentences later, he goes on to tell some of the assumptions that are involved in this fundamental physical law. The system must be very weakly coupled to a bath that is large enough to have a, a fixed constant temperature. Coupling must be indefinite or not known precisely. All the fast things must have happened and all the slow things not. And so we can test that with molecular dynamics. So yes, we have a small system that's coupled to a large bath. So the large bath has a fixed temperature, that's fine. The coupling's indefinite and not known precisely. So, you know, all these things in between, they're not well known or we don't need to know what they are. All the fast things, we'll talk about that later. The trouble is what the energy that goes into Boltzmann's factor comes from the infinite bath. It does not come from the system. It's the energy change of the infinite bath which changes the entropy of the infinite bath. And that comes from minus the energy of the system itself. That's where the minus sign comes from in, in, in Boltzmann's factor is because it's the energy conservation between the system and the bath. But the energy had to get from the system to the bath somehow. And the only way it can get from the system to the bath is through the neighboring blocks. And so when you include the energy of the neighboring blocks, which is strongly anti-correlated with the energy of the system itself, there's a large negative energy here that cancels out most of the energy of the fluctuation of the block. And so the amount of energy that gets to the bath is a tiny fraction of the energy of this fluctuation. So this is a tiny fraction, this sum is a tiny fraction of the, of the energy of, of the block, or you can think of it as a large temperature. So this being much smaller than expected can be, is equivalent to this temperature being much larger than expected. And the, you work out the, the net energy that gets to the bath and you get uh, between the, the center block and the nearest neighbor blocks and you get an extra temperature of 25 instead of 55 and 3.6 instead of 7.2. So it's in the right direction and on the right order, smaller because we have not included the next nearest neighbor blocks and other blocks in between. So if we were to include all of the energy of the local systems and uh, that then eventually had to couple to the infinite bath, then these sh should agree better. Furthermore, you can watch this uh, behavior as a function of time from a molecular dynamic simulation, and that's what's shown here. So this is correlations of, of the autocorrelations are in the black squares. This is correlations as a function of time, picoseconds. This is in the nitromethane uh, simulation model. So the autocorrelations normalized to one in the black blocks, squares. The red circles are the nearest neighbor 
blocks and uh, correlated with the central block, anti-correlated. So you see it's about 50% anti-correlated here. This is at 100 Kelvin. So 100 Kelvin is here, 50%. So that's this symbol here, is here. And then we can watch that as a function of time. So uh, second neighbors are green, third neighbors are blue. And you see that initially all of the, essentially all of the energy comes from the nearest neighbor blocks and not from second or third neighbor blocks, not from the bath, certainly not from the bath. The energy is traded back and forth between the center block and the neighboring block. They fluctuate out of phase roughly. And then the energy, the fact that there's a fluctuation happened gets out to the second and third neighbor blocks only after a certain amount of time. And you, you can get the speed at which this information gets out from the fluctuation as a function of time and you get roughly the velocity of sound. And so this fluctuation is happening faster, too fast for the information to get out to the bath. And so that's why it is not controlled by Boltzmann's factor is because it's not coupled to the bath during the time scale of the fluctuation. Okay, so that's it for computer simulations. Any questions before I go on? Okay, so, so this I, is- a, I, I guess I do have a question. Yes. Um, um, uh, so I, I'm, you, you have this um, behavior, the potential energy is, is described, uh, assuming it seems that it's harmonic. I mean, the, this three halves uh, form is, is based on, you know, the way you had the partition function. Yes. You know, you had the R squared. So yes. you're, you know, that's based on a harmonic approach. Yes. But it is a Leonard Jones potential. So, yes. you know, I guess there's two elements to the question. One is, um, you know, how do you know that the effects you're seeing aren't the, you know, inharm inharmonicity sort of manifesting itself? And sort of the second thing that comes to mind is that you know, harmonic systems don't are are uncoupled, so that you know whenever you know they are very slow to to diffuse or uh, energy to the extent that they you know are not inharmonic. I mean, you need the inharmonicity to you know to allow the the energy in the various modes of motion to to, to dissipate. Or, you know, yeah, to couple them. You have it. You've hit it exactly on the head. That's exactly what it comes from. It comes from the anharmonic interaction of the second neighbors and higher neighbors. But, you know, standard theory predicts or assumes that that doesn't make any difference when you're at low enough temperature that you're at the bottom of the well, uh, that it will adjust so that everything is at the bottom of the well. But no, you're absolutely right. It has to do with the localization of energy due to anharmonic effects. And we can clearly show it. It's actually, we believe it's related to Anderson localization, that the anharmonic atoms are not in a good crystal. They cannot, uh, they do not uh, fluctuate coherently and so that they basically form disorder. The second neighbors form a disorder that, that, that localizes the energy. And, and uh, we have a paper on this, uh, I don't see it listed, but somewhere uh, it finally got published after two years of battling with referees. And um, so uh, we explained all this in terms of and, you know, possibly Anderson localization, but you're absolutely right, it has to do with the anharmonic uh, and harmonicity of the of the second neighbor. So I'll just quickly go back to show you that here, when you have the pure harmonic crystal, yes, it's it it it's a little bit low, and there's a reason for that. But uh, it's at least temperature independent, and 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 seems to follow. But when you add that second neighbor, that's when all this energy localization happens. So yes, you you're absolutely right. Good good point. A follow-up question on that? Yes. Uh, so can I think of it uh, like this, where if you have harmonic potentials, then you have all your system eigenstates are extended. So there's no localization at all. Yes. Uh, so from that perspective, if you have Leonard Jones coupling throughout the whole lattice, wouldn't you still have, even though they are unharmonic, wouldn't you still have completely extended states? That's what all the referees. That's what all the referees said. Yes, but um, uh, th these are the results from a standard software, and I believe you know I've heard other people say, "Oh, that explains why I cannot get specific heat from fluctuations." So it it seems to be mm -hmm. a very general phenomenon, and mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, 
uh, that there is a localization. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, I suggest, uh, I hope you can get a copy of my paper, our paper. It's mm -hmm. um, in Physica A. Uh, I can send it to you if you like, but it, it, it's a long story. All right. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Okay. So uh, now I'm, you know, way out of time, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to hurry. Um, so now I'll start talking about the theory. So I'm going to try to explain nanothermodynamics and nonlinear correction statistical mechanics all in one slide. But it's a complicated slide, so I'll start slowly. So this is again is a fundamental equation of thermodynamics, the, also known as the Gibbs equation, the combined first and second laws. I told you where the different contributions to energy come from. This equation is based upon three or four assumptions. The system must be linear, it must be homogeneous, it must be in thermal equilibrium and in the thermodynamic limit. One thing we mean by linear is that the intensive environmental variables, temperature, pressure, and chemical potential, are the linear first order derivatives of the energy with respect to the extensive environmental variables, entropy, volume, and the number of particles. Higher order derivatives are neglected. One thing we mean by homogeneous is that you have the same temperature everywhere. And that's what the experiments have shown is not true. Experiments and computer simulations have shown that's not true. Uh, and therefore, you have nanoscale regions inside the sample that are finite sized. And so you cannot assume that the systems that are responding are infinitely large. And so the one thing we know for sure is that there are non-extensive contributions to energy. So in addition to the bulk term, there are surface terms, length scale, effects, fluctuation terms, etc. These terms are always there, but if you have uh, uh, more than a million particles or so, then these terms are 1% uh, or less. And so they're negligible for large systems, you'd think. But I'll show that it's not true for most systems when they subdivide this, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Anyway, so if you change this side of the equation, and if energy is to be conserved, you have to change something on this side of the equation. And so that's what Terrell Hill did 58 years ago, is he added this new pair of conjugate variables, the subdivision potential, and the number of subdivisions. So to explain what these mean, um, the, uh, the number of subdivisions, eta, so here in this cartoon, eta is equal to one. There's, there's no subdivision, uh, zero. The whole sample is fluctuating as a single unit. Now the sample is fluctuating as four different units. And as you continue to subdivide, because you broaden these levels, for instance, provide new uh, degrees of freedom, then the energy actually goes down. And so by subdividing, this is just a cartoon sketch of what the energy does, the energy tends to go down when you subdivide. So the sample should subdivide until it reaches thermal equilibrium here at the, at the minimum energy, the minimum free energy. And so that's actually where this uh, epsilon is equal to zero. This is the derivative of energy with respect to number of subdivisions. So the slope is zero here in thermal equilibrium. So thermal equilibrium usually corresponds to this epsilon equaling to zero, but epsilon was not zero to get to that point. There were changes in energy to get to this equilibrium, but even though epsilon is equal to zero in equilibrium. Okay, so the thermal equilibrium of most samples requires that you allow the sample to subdivide into smaller systems that can lower the energy and increase the entropy, as I will show shortly. And so you can also include nonlinear terms like this. So how does that change the statistical mechanics? So standard statistical mechanics is actually based upon the change in entropy, but it's assumed that you have only a linear term. And so the change in the entropy comes from the bath and the conservation of energy is this minus delta U. But in fact, there are higher order terms and something like this, nonlinear corrections to Boltzmann's factor includes higher order terms. Well, we're not the first to include higher order terms in Boltzmann's factor. Uh, 110 years ago, Einstein used it to describe critical opalescence. So what do we do differently? Well, we include additional terms and we also find the thermal equilibrium of these small systems by using nanothermodynamics, which Einstein did not have in 1910. Okay, so let's see uh, an important ingredient in nanothermodynamics is the ensemble that you use. So here's different ensembles. 
So imagine a small part of a large system with uh, uh, adiabatic walls, uh, solid walls. So the number of particles of volume and the energy are fixed. So the fluctuation that's happening in here without coupling to its environment. If the walls are thin enough, diathermal let uh, energy pass in and out, then energy fluctuates and temperature replaces energy as an environment of variables. That's the canonical ensemble. If you uh, let the walls be permeable, so particles come in and out, and the number of particles fluctuates, and chemical potential replaces the number of particles as an environment of variables, that's this grand canonical ensemble. Now imagine going one step further so that as the particles join or leave the fluctuation, you will uh, keep a constant density or something so that the volume fluctuates and you should have pressure as an environment of variable, not volume, and that's the nano canonical ensemble. This ensemble is ill-defined in standard thermodynamics because you take away the heat energy with this uh, Legendre transform, you take away the work energy with this Legendre transform, you take away the chemical energy with this uh, reverse, take away all the different sources of energy and there's nothing left. There's nothing to control the sizes of these uh, systems. Well, that's where the new pair of conjugate variables comes in. For the first time, this ensemble can be well-defined. And so here's a quote from Hill saying that, you know, Guggen Guggenheim introduced this ensemble, I think it was in the late 1930s. Prigogine criticized it, Prigogine, the Nobel Prize winning Belgian statistical mechanics person. Uh, the author, Terrell Hill, believes that the present treatment removes Prigogine's objection. Professor Prigogine has authorized the author to state that he agrees with the treatment. So this is the only systematic way to uh, address this nanocanonical ensemble. And it turns out that it's the crucial ensemble. There are only, it turns out that there are only two ensembles that are relevant to most real systems. The microcanonical ensemble, that's what allows the whole burning experiment where we pump energy in and it does not couple to its environment. So that you change the energy resulting in a local temperature that's different than the bath temperature. But then at long enough times, the, it couples to its environment, but it should couple all the degrees of freedom to the environment, ju not just energy, but also the volume and the number of particles should couple to its environment. So this is the, the, the ensemble that's relevant to long times. Okay, so that's, that's uh, uh, nanothermodynamics in a nutshell. Now I will go on to solve some problems using these ideas. Now, I was supposed to finish about now, um, but I'll go on until, uh, until you tell me to stop. <laughs> okay. That's okay, you can go on for a little bit. <laughs> <Okay>. All right. <clears throat> So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Gibbs paradox. So you all know what that is. That's when uh, an inconsistency between classical uh, statistical mechanics and standard thermodynamics. And standard thermodynamics says that you should be able to reversibly remove a wall between two identical systems and the entropy must not increase or else it couldn't be reversible. Um, whereas, you know, if they're different systems, the entropy does increase, but if, if it's the same, material, same types of atoms, then you remove this, the entropy must not increase. Whereas if you use classical standard statistical mechanics, that's not true. So, so I, there's gonna be a lot of math on this slide and I'm not gonna focus on the math. What the important thing is to look at the entropy per particle, normalized entropy per particle in these boxes. So, so keep your eye on these boxes. Those are the important things on this slide. Okay, so, so you know, here, here's the partition function, the canonical ensemble for a single particle. Uh, the thermal de Broglie wavelength, the volume of the box. Uh, you know, for non-interacting ideal gas particles, the partition function for n particles is, is just the partition function to the nth power. You work that out for the entropy, uh, different energy minus the Helmholtz free energy. Um, and you get three halves plus this logarithm of volume. So then with the volume doubles, this entropy per particle goes up, square root of two. So that's the Gibbs paradox. So as you all know, Gibbs paradox is one way to resolve Gibbs paradox is to assume that you have semi-classical ideal gas with all particles indistinguishable so that you divide the partition function by n factorial. When you get the logarithm for the uh, Helmholtz free energy, so you subtract you know, logarithm per particle, uh, logarithm of n factorial per particle. So n log n minus n becomes n log, just n, just log n minus one. You subtract that, minus one makes three halves, five halves. The log n puts the n in the, in the denominator here in the logarithm. And so now it is extensive when you 
add to systems. And so that resolves. That's one solution to Gibbs paradox is to assume that you have uh, uh, indistinguishable particles, but that means you have some sort of quantum symmetry happening across meters. You know, high temperature atoms that are meters apart have to somehow be indistinguishable. And, and so there are still discussions as to whether or not that's a reality. So uh, furthermore, another fact is that, you know, Sterling's uh, formula actually has additional terms. And so in reality, there should be this extra term here from here. But, you know, for Avogadro's number of particles, this is negligible in one trillion trillionths or so, very, very tiny fraction. However, if you have a hundred to a thousand particles, this can become on the order of 1%. So it's not negligible if you have smaller systems. For the grand canonical ensemble, that term goes away because the grand canonical ensemble in involves summing over all the different sizes. So this is just the Taylor series expansion of an exponential. So you don't need Taylor uh, Sterling's approximation. You get this Sakura Tetrode uh, expression exactly without any correction in the grand canonical ensemble. The trouble is, you know, if you have a fixed box size and variable number of particles, that's not realistic for most uh, uh, samples. It doesn't really matter anyway, because this term is negligible. The real change happens when you go to the nanocanonical ensemble. Now, when you take the next Legendre transform over all volumes, this is, you know, integral of exponentials. This is the answer with the uh, uh, activity, absolute activity here as uh, a function of chemical potential. It can be written in terms of the average number of atoms in a system by uh, taking the, the appropriate derivative. And so then the subdivision potential in minus kT logarithm of this partition function looks like this in terms of the average number of particles. Then you get the uh, entropy per particle and it looks like this. So it has the Sakura tetrode part and an additional part, which is subadditive. This term is subadditive. Furthermore, the thermal equilibrium should be given by where this epsilon equals zero, where the subdivision potential equals zero. Well, the average number of particles cannot go to zero because you have some particles in the system. So there must be some limit to how small. So let's say that this average number of particles per system goes to one or something like that, close to one. So it's almost the thermal equilibrium. You know, there has to be some sort of interactions which would make this inaccurate. So let's say the average number of particles goes to one, average number of particles per system goes to one, but the volume is also very small on the order of nanometers. <laughs> and so this ratio still works as a sakura equation does, but it refers to small parts inside the large system. And so uh, this term being sub-additive, it actually favors subdividing into small systems. So there's only one of these terms for the entire system. There are two of these terms for two systems. There are a million of these terms for a million systems. So the entropy can go up by several percent by subdividing into the nanocanonical ensemble. So this is the thermal equilibrium of an ideal gas. Plus, you do not need macroscopic quantum mechanics to make the particles indistinguishable. These systems contain on average one particle or so, but maybe well, there will be two particles in here. So yes, you can have indistinguishable particles when there are two atoms inside of a nanometer sized box, if they collide or have their wave functions overlap. The usual criterion for when quantum mechanics is necessary, but not you do not need quantum mechanics to describe atoms that are meters apart inside of a large system. So it solves, it's a new solution to Gibbs paradox that does not require macroscopic quantum mechanics. Okay, questions on that? Okay, a similar thing for ferromagnetism. Uh, so standardizing model, one dimensional ferromagnetism Here's the partition function. Here I will focus on the number of particles. So this is this is the solution given by Ising, you know, in zero field, 1925, standard answer. We'll look at finite size systems where there uh, are, let's say, n bonds and n plus one spins. That extra spin adds another factor of two. So there's two to the n plus one rather than two to the n for the partition function. But if n goes to infinity, that's negligible. Furthermore, 
if you look at the average energy, you take the derivative of the logarithm and this goes away anyway. So it doesn't really make any difference that there's a finite sized or infinite sized gives the same answer. However, in the nano canonical ensemble, you take this, the second Legendre transform over all different sizes like this. This is the nano canonical partition function. Subdivision potential looks like this. So thermal equilibrium is given by when the, the partition function is equal to one. This equals to one when the average number of particles is equal to cosh, J over KT. So for the nano canonical ensemble, the average number of particles at high temperature is one. No, sorry, this is the average number of bonds. The average number of bonds at high temperature is one for the thermal equilibrium of the Ising model. And all, it diverges to infinite systems only as temperature goes to zero. So this is the number of bonds in there. The energy is the same, uh, you know, just for, with the average, the energy per particle is the same, doesn't make any difference. So how can that be? If you have an infinite system, then it must subdivide. If it can, thermal equilibrium, it can increase its entropy and lower its free energy by subdividing into ensemble of independent systems like this, and, and we do get the same uh, we get the same answer if we have uh, subdivision. So these are non-interacting bonds uh, where there's no exchange interaction between spins. Let's say these are high energy interactions. These are low energy interactions. You can do the statistical mechanics on this model, and we get roughly the same thing. So that's what's happening if you, have, if you have an infinite system and if there's some mechanism that allows it to not interact between neighboring spins, it will form this heterogeneity and that is the thermal equilibrium of the Ising model. That's in one dimension. Um, we adapted it to high dimensions by using mean field theory and so I'll just mm, talk about this briefly. So this is a non-classical critical scaling. This is a logarithm of magnetic susceptibility as a function of reduced temperature log log plot. Um, the, uh, so uh, the Curie-Weiss law says that this should have a slope of minus one. And indeed at high temperature, these, these are measurements from the literature of the best available crystals, best measurements on the best crystals available in 2000 when this paper was published. And the slope of minus one at high temperature, Curie-Weiss law works at high temperature, but as you get close to the transition, the slopes get steeper than minus one. And for instance, they get close to the Ising model slope of 1.239, I believe it is, uh, for instance, for gadolinium here, quite close. But if you look really closely, close to the transition, the slope is getting less than that minus 1.24. And there's a little bit of curvature in the data and our model, which is based on the nanocanonical ensemble with mean field theory, mean field theory, but finite sized mean field theory gives the solid curves that captures this curvature. So when I published this paper in 2000, 20 years ago, I did not know a single theoretical physicist who believed this result. Now, 20 years later, I know maybe three or four physicists who might believe, uh, theoretical physicists who might believe this result. And so I was wondering why. Uh, so here's what I found in the, some, the literature. Um, so uh, from experimentalists, the critical exponents of iron and nickel are very similar to each other, while those for cobalt are clearly different. There is no theoretical understanding of these results. And here's, this is put a little bit, more poetically, it is thus as a theorist and experimentalist in this field often behave like two trains passing in the night. Why is this? So this was, you know, uh, six or seven years after the Nobel Prize was given for, for a non-classical critical scaling. And so I'm not the only one who sees this. It's just hard to see. But if you take the derivative of these curves to get the effective scaling exponent as a function of temperature, this is what you find. So the Ising model predicts a monotonic increase in the critical scaling exponent, uh, in the ex scaling exponent, effective scaling exponent as you approach the, the, the temperature, whereas the data show a peak and then back down towards one, and our model shows a peak back down towards one. And more recent data shows clearly that the that it never reaches a constant non-classical critical scaling exponent going only down to one close enough to the transition. Okay, so um, as for the arrow of time, Boltzmann's paradox, sometimes called. So you know, as you know, Boltzmann spent much of his career tr 
career trying to find a connection between classical mechanics and statistical mechanics, thermodynamics. And the, the issue, the, the complicating factor is that most of all microscopic physics is reversible. So you can change the sign of time and nothing happens, as shown here. Um, whereas for thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, it's based upon the assumption that entropy evolves, increases, reaches a maximum, and then does not change. And that's the basis of Boltzmann's factor. So Boltzmann argued for this connection, even though he knew about Louisville's theorem, which says that the, the phase space volume cannot change for anything governed by Hamilton's equation. So this, here's a picture of what's happened. So phase space, you have a, a system starting off with a given volume of phase space. That volume stays the same, same volume. It just becomes more ramified. Uh, as, it, as time goes on, something like that. But the total volume cannot change. Therefore, the entropy cannot change for anything that's governed by Louisville's theorem. And similar things for uh, Lo Schmidt. Uh, if you reverse the velocities of everything, it will, the entropy would go down. And, and uh, Poincare, um, that it must reach its uh, initial state again at some time later. So how can that be? How can there be this connection between classical mechanics and statistical mechanics well, nanothermodynamics provides an answer. So if nature subdivides into small systems so that we know that the system starts off in this small region and you have only the resolution of these small regions, you don't know what's happening inside them, you know that the system is in this box to start with. As time goes on, it spreads into other boxes, the entropy increases, even though the volume does not change. The number of boxes that it occupies could occupy does increase. And so entropy can increase if you have a, you know, a, 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 a specific size for the systems that are in, in nature as nanothermodynamics gives. So that the new feature is, this has been known, actually I think um, Gibbs was the first person to point this out, that this is a way to have entropy increase uh, even with Louisville's theorem. But there was no systematic way of finding what should be the volumes of these small systems inside of phase space, whereas nanothermodynamics perhaps gives you that answer. Okay, that's, I guess, it. Thank you for your attention. Very good. Excellent. Let, let's, thank let's do the. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Very nice. Um, can I ask a question? I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, I want to comment on something that Dave had pointed out when he asked about the harmonic uh, interaction. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, nonlinear interactions, then video theorem does provide a way of finding out how much of the energy on average would wind up being potential and how much is in it. So that's, that's one thing that you probably have already explored. Right? Yes, well, really, you know, according to I, what I believe is correct, that the systems should all get their atoms in a harmonic potential. When you add the, the potential from all atoms together, they should all be at the bottom of a potential well. So it's not, uh, uh, so even the second neighbors, well, you know, the second neighbors are of course at the bottom of the potential well from their first neighbors, but uh, also from the second neighbor on the other side, that, 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 let's see if I can go back to this. Um, so, So I've only shown the interaction from this atom over here. There'll be, you know, another atom to second neighbor over here, and that will cancel this slope when it's in equilibrium, when it's at the bottom, when it's in its equilibrium position. So this is a consequence of the dynamics, the fluctuations around that equilibrium that causes this, uh, this anharmonic effect. And it's, um, right. You know, the, the harmonic potential is by far the dominant uh, uh, centering force on these atoms, but 
any kind of fluctuation here will cause uh, excess fluctuations in, in um, uh, potential energy. And in fact, we, we've been able to get a, we have a, a theory, I think you could call it a theory, to, that actually gives a quantitative agreement with this temperature dependence. And the theory is to simply um, include Boltzmann's factor only for the harmonic atoms and neglect Boltzmann's factor for the anharmonic atoms. So you do not include a Boltzmann's factor for the harmonic atoms. That allows, that is because the harmonic atoms do not couple to the bath. So they are, they fluctuate uh, more than the harmonic atoms because they are not coupled to the bath. And that's what gives the excess um, uh, 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 potential energy fluctuations. We get a quantitative agreement, you know, with, within a few, a few percent of, of, of this temperature dependence for the, for the Leonard-Jones potential by assuming that Boltzmann's factor does not apply to the anharmonic interactions. I see. That's interesting because, uh, I mean, the whole point of the fermi pasta problem was that the nonlinear effect is very strong. And yes. we know that for a fact because we, we get this in our study. The other thing yes. that I wanted to point out is, uh, of course, what's important here is the free energy rather than the actual energy. So the thermal uh, aspect and fluctuations associated with thermal aspects is then equally strong, uh, which would obviously mean that the nonlinear effects would come into that. That's one point, right? Yes, good point, yes. And yes. the other related point is that, uh, and this also goes back in some sense to fermi pasteurian problem, that when you have even weakly nonlinear effects, what we call weakly nonlinear is actually not really a very good statement because there is no such thing as a weakly nonlinear problem. Yes. So <laughs> if something is slightly nonlinear, that nonlinearity can actually make a mess of things. Yes. Which means that any perturbation theory which involves nonlinearity is at best a high frequency short time theory. Yes. So that's the other part that presumably is also at play in what you see. So, so yes, you're absolutely right. What we believe nature does, which is different than molecular dynamic simulations, is nature breaks up into independently fluctuating parts. So that then this strong coupling between neighboring blocks goes away. And therefore, uh, statistical mechanics can be restored as long as you use nanothermodynamics to uh, have this system subdivide into blocks. You know, just like the, the blocks in the, um, uh, here, in, in, in the nanocanonical ensemble. So, so here we have assumed that nature has subdivided into blocks of non-interacting particles. Well, for an ideal gas, that's easy. Um, but we believe that, that, that nature does that. It's not in classical molecular dynamic simulations. We believe that's what's missing from classical molecular dynamic simulations, why they do not agree with statistical mechanics uh, and, and, and nanothermodynamics. So that's what happened here with the, uh, the breaking up of the interaction of the spins. So, so, you know, the exchange interaction in spins in magnetic systems is a, is a quantum mechanical effect and requires that electrons exchange between these particles. And that, that's not, that doesn't, may not always happen. It's possible that nature does not exchange these electrons to have this exchange interaction, so that it's only exchanging between these two and subdivide. That's what the, the thermodynamics says, if it can happen, it must happen because it increases the entropy and lowers the free energy. But there has to be a mechanism. I'm speculating that it has to do with quantum mechanics, what the quantum mechanical coherence between the interacting spins and a lack of coherence between the neighboring spins. And that makes sense because we know that there's quantum mechanics on the micro scale, but no macroscopic quantum mechanics for most large systems. So they, um, uh, so there has to be a boundary, a crossover somewhere between quantum mechanics on the short scale and cl uh, classical mechanics on the large scale. We believe it's this length scale, the length scale of the thermodynamic heterogeneity that happens, that's measured in virtually every substance, seems to be a universal phenomenon, but is not contained in standard thermodynamics or standard statistical so, mechanics. So I have a question about, you know, what sets the scale that you're talking about? The blocks have a scale. Yes. 
But I mean, what is it that sets the scale uh, in a well, given physical system? Uh, theoretically, what sets the scale is the this size scale, the distribution of sizes that that maximizes the entropy, minimizes the free energy. That's theoretically what's set. Experimentally, it's found to typically be one to three nanometers in most systems. One to three nanometers length scale. So, you know, on the order of 10 to a few hundred, maybe a thousand atoms or molecules. That's what's measured as the typical correlation lengths inside most substances, which is a, you know, a reasonable length scale for quantum mechanics to be dominant. Um, but, but let's say let's say that you know I have some very good information about the interactions Hamiltonian of the system. From uh -huh. that, is it possible to calculate that scale in any way? No, I don't. I don't think so. It has. It, in uh, I would love to know. I don't know. I believe I'm not smart enough to to understand these things. But what all I know is that the thermodynamics tells us that there is an equilibrium size and a distribution around that size. So if if nature can find a way to obey thermodynamics, that's what she'll do. One, one uh, point I, I'd like to make is, uh, <clears throat> so we've been looking at these uh, nonlinear systems now for a, for a long time. And yes. one, of the, one of the takeaway messages is that energy exchange in nonlinear systems is fundamentally different by and large from uh, exchanging energy through quantum. So, uh, so a one-on-one -on -one version of it would be in nonlinear systems, you have three kinds of guys. You have your solitary waves, so they are one kind of good guys. Uh, you have localized excitations, that's another kind of good guy. And then you have a hodgepodge of the two, that's the third kind of good guy. So these are the guys that basically exchange energy when you turn on nonlinearity. If you, if you were to flip a switch of nonlinearity, then these are the three guys that show up. Now, with these three guys, there are fundamental length scales that are set by the potential. So in a very classical sense, the potential sets the length scale of these three actors. And you, you mentioned a few nanometers. And my imagination uh, right now would tell me that's not inconsistent with the length scale that you will get from these three kinds of actors, along with phonons. So your fundamental fluctuations, your departure from rigorous equipartition at that length scale uh, is something that we see when we turn on the slightest of nonlinearity. Uh, in, of course, we see mostly in 1D because that's, that has been where we study the best. But we are also beginning to do some studies in 3D, uh, of course, very simple model system. And you begin to see same kind of effect. Uh, and, and there is an interesting point here, which I don't know if it applies to these experiments. There is an intermediate time scale and there is a, there is a really long time scale. Yes. In the intermediate time scale, these fluctuations tend to be very large and actually they last for a long time. They can last for several decades in time. So intermediate, and then they move over. In the intermediate time scales are the crucial ones. Yes, that's exactly right. It's the intermediate time scales that allow the system to uh, form its heterogeneity and maximize its entropy, minimize its free energy by these intermediate time scales. It, you know, it's uh, long times. So, so th what we imagine is that these blocks or the idea of a block is um, well defined over intermediate time scales. Then at long times, of course, the blocks grow and shrink and they are not fixed in space. These are you know, in, in, in nature, in reality, these things are not fixed in space. They grow and shrink. Usually they're not fixed in space. They grow and shrink so that they have an average size and a distribution of sizes, but it's the intermediate timescales that give all the extra entropy that is missing from the statics and the long-term homogeneous thermodynamics. It, absolutely, intermediate timescale, crucial. So, so, so just uh, maybe related to what you were saying, so here is the harmonic lattice with fluctuations that are below the equipartition theorem. That's because there's positive correlation between the energy in the center block and the neighboring block. So the, the, the energy profile for a harmonic lattice, you know, something is sort of bell shaped. There's, there's a strong correlation within the block, positive correlation with the neighboring block, sort of bell shaped 
around the block for the harmonic lattice. When you add the anharmonicity, it's, I don't know what's that, what that's called. It's, you know, it's positive correlation here, negative correlation with the, with the neighbors, something like that. Very different behavior when you add that second neighbor and harmonic effect. Have very, very different. Yes, I agree completely. Mm. There is a question from Hao uh, Zheng, Hao is my colleague here. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he asks in a magnetic system, do you need imperfections for decoupling or it happens even in a perfect crystal? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, I'm an experimentalist, so what I say is everything we measure in the laboratory is not perfect enough. And so, uh, you know, the molecular dynamic simulations are done on what is supposed to be a perfect crystal. Um, and so I believe it does not require imperfections. Uh, these are the best uh, samples available at Max Planck Institute, at, uh, uh, for instance, did these, these measurements, were, were involved in, in these measurements. Um, so the best uh, crystals available show evidence of heterogeneity. It's, there seems to be no way around it. Uh, even ideal computer simulations also show this evidence for local fluctuations. Good question. Any further questions? I do have one last comment. Yes. Uh, so this TP mu ensemble, th there is a paper, I think from 1950, if I'm not mistaken, by, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Longe Higgins, L-O-N-G-U-E-T, Longe Higgins, who was a British chemist. Huh. Uh, and he wrote about this, this TP mu ensemble in a paper in Physical A. I should have yeah. it somewhere, but, but I'd have to share. Yeah, so around that time in the 1950s, uh, this thing was explored. If I recall correctly, he worked with the TP mu ensemble in the context of a gravitating system. Really? Because oh, that, that's that very interesting. Yes. And he also pointed out that the partition function essentially ends up with singularity. So, really? Huh. so this is my recollection. It, 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 and uh, in the 19, early 80s, uh, based upon uh, Leibovitz, uh, Perkins, and Verley's mm -hmm. uh, generalized yes. ensemble theory, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were a bunch of papers written by a group from Clemson, uh, Will Graven and John Ray were some of the players along with Jim Hale, who also wrote a book on simulation. Uh, and they talked about a generalized ensemble theory uh, whereby basically constructing the Gibbs relation uh, in the right way, quote unquote, you can actually extract the TP mu ensemble is a natural consequence of all the plus the genre transforms you can do. So, so that's very interesting. I, I would like to get those references and, and look at them. So, you know, Terrell Hill, Terrell Hill was an amazing guy. So I, I have some private information about him. I was going to give it in this talk, but uh, I ran out of time. Uh, uh, I wrote his biography for the National Academy of Sciences when after his death. Um, but he, he was an amazing guy. He, he wrote roughly 250 papers, most of them as single author. He, was an ex he wrote 10 books. Four of them have been republished by Dover. He was an extraordinary man. Um, but I believe, and I think he agrees, that the only way to systematically treat this, what, I, what we call the nanocanonical ensemble, is to have this extra term that no one else has. So he, in his 1956 book, he tried to treat it using traditional methods. And, you know, even Prigogine was impressed, thought that it was good enough. But Hill, his thermodynamics of small systems is from 63 and 64. Then he finally was able to treat this ensemble correctly. Um, and I, I don't believe there's any way to really get the true answer without including some sort of finite size effects contributions to energy. You know, energy is just not yeah. conserved. Yeah, exactly. The, You're this missing is the work that was done by the Clemson uh, folks, actually. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll send you that paper. They were in Journal yeah. of Chemical Physics and Molecular. Um, so, so, so yeah, it's it's kind of cool. I, I teach that in my grad stat mech class. Yes. So yeah, it, I think you'll enjoy that. My, yes, sir. I, I mean, they, they also talk about his work, if I'm not mistaken, in the early papers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, wonderful. No, so, I'm, I'm very interested in the history. I'd like to to learn learn more. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, then we can. You can unmute yourself, and we can uh, we can uh, basically say you know say thank you to to Ralph. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I hope it was uh, understandable. Thank you. This was fantastic. So oh, I uh, thank you so much, and thank you everybody for joining in. Thank and, you. And yes. Playing this crazy game. It was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Right, bye bye. Take care. Everyone be safe. Bye. Everyone be safe. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.